Hi, I'm Dave, one of the pastors here at High Rock, and I'm so glad you're joining us for worship today. You know, our world is obsessed with power. The headlines are full of battles for political power. Nations build up their armies and alliances in order to overpower their foes. So many arguments on Twitter are really over who should have the power to decide what's right. A lot of people played the Megabucks lottery recently because a billion dollars would give us the power to make all of our dreams come true. Why do we love power so much? You know, it's not actually about power at all. It's what we think that power can get us. You know, what we really want is love, and joy, security, and the ability to make a difference in our world, which seems so broken and which so many people are hurting. And this is why today's sermon is so important. You know, history proves that the kind of power we dream about rarely accomplishes the goals we dream about, or at least not for very long. Power can get people to obey me, but not to love me. Power can get me great health care that might postpone death slightly, but not prevent it. The kind of power we dream about is a lot less powerful than we like to imagine. Today, we're going to be talking about a different kind of power, one that's accessible to all of us and can actually achieve some of the dreams that worldly power never quite accomplishes. So let's dive in. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Hi, I'm Hui Lee. Today I'm going to share um, a bit about my baptism story. I'm Vietnamese American. Uh, my mother is Catholic and my father is Buddhist. Yeah, so growing up with uh, parents with different faith backgrounds uh, was kind of interesting because I didn't really practice any Buddhist practices. I didn't go to temple or anything like that. Uh, so I grew up predominantly just in the, the Catholic faith. Faith meant to me growing up, um, it was really, it felt like just like a, another class. Um, looking back on it, it just felt like something that my mother wanted me to do that I needed to learn about. And a lot of the practicing was like rules based. Um, it felt like, you know, these are the things I had to do to make my mother happy to be closer to God. So believing in God when I was younger honestly felt like homework. 
these are the simple things they want me to focus on. And that was, you know, schoolwork, uh, faith, religion. So a lot of it was, well, I'm going to do this to, well, because my parents were asking me to do so. When I got to college, it was a natural separation that no one was really telling me how I was supposed to practice. And I never really got into the habits of like, go, I wouldn't say not going to church regularly. Um, no one was telling me to go to church regularly, right? Um, no one was waking me up on Sunday at nine o'clock to, to rush us to church. Um, so I think there was a natural falling out where I didn't really have it in my forefront to practice, to pray, to uh, really look for God. Um, so th I think the transition from when I was younger into when I was in college was, I guess, a sense of freedom um, or I guess rebellion. There wasn't like my parents breathing down my neck about how I was supposed to do things. And because of the way they raised me and how they did everything for me, a lot of everything I was learning was for the first time. So I was kind of an open door to try to explore my own things, experiment, um, and you know, really make my own mistakes. Um, it, I think looking back on it, the things that I would get in trouble for was not always right or wrong or, or good or bad. It was just that I've always learned, don't do that or do this instead. Now, this is something I realized recently was my thought of like what prayer was was very different than what I think about it as today. Um, I think growing up, it was like, if you do something wrong, you say a few all fathers, Hail Marys, and um, you know that's that, right? And I think up until like I was an adult, I never really had like an open conversation in terms of prayer with God. Or, so that, that was an interesting shift of mindset. And I think that's how I kind of began to have a closer relationship with God, was being able to openly talk and not thinking of it as like going in with parameters um, and, and how to actually approach uh, the situation. Towards the end of college, I met Veronica, who's my partner um, now. Uh, and when I met her, she made it explicitly clear that faith was very important to her. And I think even with the experience I had in college, I'd always believed in God, um, even though I wasn't even though I didn't necessarily have the tools that would bring me closer to him. And obviously with how long our relationship has gotten, um, it became more and more clear of like what that actually meant. And as I was meeting her family, you know, how my thought process of what a relationship with God was, was very different than how her, her family and how she experienced it. Looking at their lives, it was so integrated in everything they would do. Um, the Veronica's father is a pastor. So he, speaking to him was pretty interesting because on one end, I don't know if he's talking to me as a pastor or if he's talking to me as her father. Um, and a lot of times that would get blended in, but you know, I, I would hear what he was saying in, in terms of questioning, um, you know, what's really stopping me, right? Um, as much as I would constantly say that I believe in God, it doesn't really look like I do. Veronica's younger brother, Evan, uh, closest to her in age, was baptized. It raised a bunch of questions for me. Um, like why, right? That gave me an opportunity to kind of pick his brain um, as well as um, his dad's, or the, Veronica's dad's brain about like why someone would want to go through that experience again, what the purpose of it is and what the meaning of it is. I think I've had enough exchanges with people who have had faith backgrounds and my own kind of walk that a lot of it would feel coincidental. But I think looking back on it, a lot of it was just, you know, they say, right, the Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways. Um, that a, a lot of it was actually not only you know, um, like God working through people as well as myself, but it, it really felt like a lot of opportunities where I would be invited back and that I could come back to faith and not really feel like I did something wrong for being gone for so long. And I think the timing of High Rock Cambridge asking if anyone wanted to get baptized and being more involved in the church and beginning to serve, um, it just felt like a, a, a rightful timing thing. Um, I think oftentimes, uh, I think people might be looking for more profound reasons, uh, but I think for us it was, it just all made sense for myself to be able to like practice and, and seek, I want to be able to create that for others as well. And I think that's something that me and my partner talk about oftentimes, wherever we can and things that we're good at, we'll try to help. But you know, trying to do that every day or, or praying every day, I'm trying to do a lot more. What I hope is that you know we're building a, a congregation or, or um, a safe space where people feel like they're connected, um, that they can, you know, that they're not just stopping by, but they're actually building relationships that you know, last longer than how 
however long they're here for. Join me as we pray, asking God to illuminate the truth we encounter in Scripture. Spirit of God, you inspired the saints of old to share your truth through the Scriptures. Speak to us now that we may receive your word, believe it, and walk in your wisdom and love. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading today is a selection of verses from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. You can follow along with me in your own Bible or on the screen as I read. Hear the word of the Lord. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them his, this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Hello, High Rock. I'm so glad to be with you today. Truly, I count this opportunity to speak with you about Jesus as one of my great joys and privileges. Back when I was in high school and college, in the long, long ago, superheroes and comic books were not cool like they are now. The only people who talked about superheroes back then were little kids and nerds like me. But all that started to change when I was in college. DC Comics published one of their first storylines created for an adult audience, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. It was a dark, gritty story and art style long before everything became dark and gritty. It became one of the most influential creations in all of comic book history. The fourth and final comic reached an epic climax in the attempt to answer one of life's eternal questions. It was a question my group of friends had all asked ourselves and discussed and debated over and over. In fact, I'm going to share that question. And if you have asked that question yourself, I want you to raise your hand up high so everyone can see that they're not alone. So if you've asked this question, just raise your hand. Ready? Would it ever be possible for Batman to beat Superman? Go ahead, raise those hands. Why does everyone always pit Batman versus Superman? I think it's because they are at opposite ends of the spectrum of superhero archetypes. Superman represents the pinnacle of raw power, a power that was his birthright, and no one is his equal. In contrast, Batman has no superpowers at all, just his wits, his wealth, and his insane level of determination. Batman represents the pinnacle of human capability, but he's still just human, not superhuman. In other words, Batman is hopelessly outclassed. But luckily for fans like me, the Dark Knight does not fight fair. First of all, Batman creates a suit of electronic battle armor. But that's not all. Before he squares off with Superman, he reroutes the entire Gotham City power grid to feed every watt of power to one point in the city in order to channel it into his battle suit. Batman knows that all that power will immediately fry his suit, but for one moment in time, he'll be able to land just one blow against the almost invincible Superman. For one instant, the raw power of an entire city courses through the arm of this one man, the Batman. Wouldn't you love to experience that kind of power? Wouldn't you love, even for just one instant, to have that kind of raw power coursing through your veins? Now, of course, 
that's just a comic book with make-believe superheroes. Here in the real world, we might not have to square off against superhumans, but we do square off against tough challenges. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could tap into some external, external source of power like the Gotham City power grid that could make us equal to the moment, even if for just a moment? And in some ways, we need a greater power than Batman or Superman. Superman's power can't unite a nation or cure addictions or end racism or fix your marriage or help you make friends or find love or save the economy or stop COVID from mutating or conquer self-destructive behaviors or cure depression and mental illness or compel your children to make wise choices or to heal the cancer that is turning your own body against you. Before we go any further today, I wanna to give you the chance to think about the real problems you face. In your life, in your family, at your school, or even your workplace. Maybe you're even wrestling with your own internal demons. In light of those real life challenges, I invite you to consider a question that is as old as comic books. If you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? What would you hope to do with that power? Take a few moments to consider that question on your own or with those around you, and we'll return in a few minutes. Welcome back. I have such a hard time answering that question. Sometimes I think I'd want Wolverine's healing ability, or maybe I'd want to be able to read minds. Actually, I think I'd want the power of foresight. I can so often look back at my decisions with 2020 hindsight, but to have the power of 2020 foresight, I can make the best decisions each time. Well, in the passage we just read, Jesus shares his final earthly words with his disciples. And the very last thing he says is that they must wait for the Holy Spirit because that will be their power. The word in Greek is dunamis. It's the root word for the English words dynamite and dynamic. It's a word that the Bible often uses to refer to miracles and the very power of God. Jesus says, you must wait because you're going to need the divine power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is giving them a task, a, a calling, that is beyond their ability to do. And Jesus gives us that same task. And he tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit because it is only with the Spirit's power that they will be able to do what Jesus asks. The Spirit is their Gotham City power grid, only far more powerful. We're in the middle of a sermon series called Centered, Moving Toward What Matters Most. And in this series, we're addressing six core affirmations, six things we believe are central to the life to which Jesus calls us. Two weeks ago, Pastor Walt started, off by, uh, started us off by talking about the centrality of the Word of God. And last week, Pastor Dave spoke about the necessity of the new birth. Today, we're talking about the importance of cultivating a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, to have the intentional practice of connecting with God's presence and power in our lives. Just as the disciples were to wait for the Spirit, we too must pay attention to and rely upon God's Spirit if we're going to have the power to do what Jesus calls us to do. A conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. What does that even mean? 
Well, there's a story in Genesis that I believe illustrates who the Spirit is and what the Spirit does. And I think this story also helps us to understand who we are and why we need a conscious connection to the Holy Spirit. The New Testament tells us that Abraham is the father of our faith, the father of all who believe, both Jewish and non-Jew. Together with his promised son Isaac, this father and son pair is used to teach us something about God the Father and God the Son. In the place where Jesus would one day lay down his life to save us, God tells Abraham not to sacrifice Isaac and instead provides a ram with its head caught in the thicket as a sacrifice. Abraham only had to imagine the pain of losing his son while God would have to live through it at the cross. It was at that very place, that mountain, where God the Father would one day provide Jesus, his son, the Lamb of God, as the ultimate sacrifice. Abraham, the father of our faith, and Isaac, his son of promise, are used to act out and foreshadow something that God would do for us all. Now, that's Genesis 22, but that's not the story I want to look at. I want to look at Genesis 24. And if Genesis 22 so clearly portrays something about God the Father Father and God the Son, might the story in Genesis 22 also reveal something about the Spirit? All I ask is that you entertain the possibility with me for a moment. In Genesis 24, we're told that Abraham had grown very old. His wife Sarah had recently passed away and their son Isaac was not married yet. So Abraham commissions his chief servant, to swear a solemn oath to travel back to the land of his people to find a wife for his son Isaac. And throughout this entire story, this chief servant is never named. Earlier, Abraham's chief servant is clearly named Eliezer. So why is he nameless in this story? We'll come back to that. This servant sets out with ten, ten camels loaded with lavish gifts to offer to the bride and her family. And after a long journey, when the servant arrives in Abraham's homeland, he prays. I imagine that on this long journey, he contemplated the incredible importance of his task. But how could he choose? How could he walk into a town where he knew knew no one and amidst all the strangers find a suitable wife for Isaac? There's more to this choice than just swiping right. The servant does what he can, but ultimately he knows that he needs a power and ability that he does not have, but God does. What he can do on his own is to go to the well. The well was the place where the whole community gathered each day and where future spouses often discovered one another and had their first conversations. We talked about this during our springtime series called Drink, where we talked about building wells that draw people in rather than building walls that keep people out. They didn't have e-harmony and Christian mingle. They went to the well. But in order to pick the right person, the servant prays to God for a special confirmation. When he asks for a drink, God's chosen partner for Isaac will offer not only a drink for him, but a drink for all his camels as well. I don't know about you, but I've never had the opportunity to water a camel. But I looked it up, and a thirsty camel can drink over 20 gallons. That's one camel. He has 10 camels. That could be over 200 gallons. That's almost a literal ton of water drawn and carried by hand. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for love and you find a person who is willing to serve up 200 gallons when you ask for a drink, you've found the right one. That's what I'm seeing. But even before he finishes praying, the servant sees Rebecca. And wouldn't you know it, when he asks for a drink, she immediately offers to water his camels as well. What an incredible answer to prayer. Given a task that was incredibly important, but beyond his ability, the servant's prayer is answered before he even finishes saying the words. The servant immediately gives Rebecca a gift that serves as a marriage proposal on behalf of Isaac. Ten shekels of silver was a year's salary back then. And these bracelets are ten shekels of gold. He went to Jared's. They head back to Rebecca's home, where the servant meets the family and shares his story. But before agreeing to the marriage, her family asks Rebecca for her opinion, which was unusual for that day and age. 
So they called Rebecca in and she said, yes, I will go. So they depart and the story ends with Isaac and Rebecca marrying. If we consider the possibility that this promised land romance mirrors and points to a larger story, who do the characters represent? Abraham and Isaac are the father and son just as earlier, but what about the servant? And what about Rebecca? Consider this. In John 14, 26, Jesus says that the Spirit is sent by the Father in the name of the Son on behalf of the Son. Similarly, the unnamed servant is sent by Abraham, the Father, in the name of Isaac, the Son. And in the name of the Son, the unnamed servant brings lavish gifts for the bride. Similarly, the Holy Spirit brings lavish gifts in the name of the Son. An entire chapter of 1 Corinthians describes the spiritual gifts that the Spirit gives. And these are not just gifts for show or consumption, but gifts that give us purpose and power. But if the unnamed servant stands in the place of the Holy Spirit, then who does Rebecca stand for? Well, there are a number of Bible passages that refer to the church, the people of God, as the bride of Christ. Jesus referred to himself as the bridegroom, pointing to heaven as a great wedding feast. And at the conclusion of his instructions about marriage, the Apostle Paul adds this, This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. If God can use our marriages to point to Christ and the church, perhaps the marriage of Rebekah and Isaac was meant to do the same thing. And just as the servant goes unnamed and never speaks of himself, but continuously points to Abraham and Isaac, the Holy Spirit also continuously points to Jesus and the Father. I asked you to indulge me and consider that Genesis 24 is intended to point us to the work of the Spirit in uniting people with Christ. But even if that's not the intended purpose of the story, I still think it's a helpful illustration to thoughtfully consider and one that ties back to our passage in Acts. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But power for what? Power to reach out in ever-widening circles to connect people to Jesus. Without the power of God's Spirit, we simply do not have the power to do what Jesus is calling us to do. Not even Superman has that kind of power. Sure, he can see through walls and bend steel with his bare hands, but his power cannot heal and connect us to God, to God's people, and to God's purposes in our lives. If you've been joining us for our daily devotions online, you may remember when Pastor Dave and I talked about the paralyzed man who was carried by his friends to the feet of Jesus. I believe they were hoping that Jesus would heal his paralysis. Instead, Jesus said, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven? I imagine he was something, I was hoping for something a little different. And at the same time, the religious leaders were offended that Jesus claimed to do something that only God could do, to forgive sins with just a word. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he said, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? It's an interesting question. You can always say that someone's sins are forgiven. We do it every Sunday after corporate confession. But how can you verify that it actually happens? But if you say, get up and walk, everyone is going to see with their own eyes. So Jesus adds, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Jesus gives us something we can see so we can believe in what we cannot see. But which was the more amazing display of power? To heal a paralyzed man or to forgive his sins? To be clear, you can forgive some sins. If I hurt you, you can forgive me or not. That is within your power. But you don't have the power to forgive me for something I do to someone else or for something I do to God. According to Jesus, That's the more amazing and more important power. Not to heal paralysis or cure cancer or even raise a person from the dead who is just going to die later on. No, the more amazing power is the one we cannot see 
except with the eyes of faith. The more important and amazing power is the one we can experience through our connection to God's Spirit, to be healed, to be transformed, to experience the divine empowerment of of spiritual gifts that give us the ability to teach and encourage and serve and lead and love in the way that Jesus calls us to do through the Spirit. When I first became a believer, I was at a place where I wanted nothing to do with my own mom. We had had a tumultuous, tumultuous relationship, one with screaming, yelling, and violence. The police were called to our house several times when I was a kid. We both felt deeply hurt and betrayed by one another. But when I became a believer, I couldn't shake the idea that God wanted me to make amends and reconcile. After all, isn't that what Jesus was all about? He crossed heaven to earth and suffered in order to bring us back together with God. If Jesus did that for us, for me, how could I not do the same? After all, isn't that what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to actually follow his example? I needed God's awakening of my conscience. I needed God's encouragement. I needed God's forgiveness when I tried and failed multiple times, often losing my temper. I needed the Spirit's power in my life. And I was reminded of that fact this past month when I was down in Jersey to visit my recovering dad. While I was down there, I spent a lot of time with my mom as well. Our relationship is so much better now, but it's still difficult at times. But I'm also much more connected to God now. It's far from perfect, and it's taken 30 years, but I'm much better at cultivating a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. We may want Superman-style power or maybe even just Batman, But what we really need is Holy Spirit power to help us to do the things that matter most. And this is something we need not just as individuals, but as a community. This conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit is one of the central affirmations of our denomination. It's part of the glue that holds us together. And at a time when there are so many conflicts and forces that might threaten to rip us apart, we need the power to listen to love, and to trust that the Holy Spirit is at work with one another. So how do we do that? How do we do this? There's so much we could address in talking about the Spirit, and there are so many insights we could share from our lives and from the Bible about how we stay connected to God's Spirit. But I'm going to just offer one suggestion today, and that's the regular habit of spontaneous conversational prayer. Some of us were taught to pray specific prayers. Maybe we learned the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, or maybe we learned the Rosary, or we learned the Acts formula, uh, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Or maybe we never learned to pray at all and we rely on others to pray for us. Wherever you are coming from, I want to encourage you to develop the habit of having your day become a running conversation with God. Pastor Walt talked about this idea two weeks ago when he talked about the pietist approach to the Christian life. That our life with God isn't just crossing a line from sinner to saint or outsider to insider. Instead, we're invited into a whole new life that is shaped by a daily dependence on God's Spirit. More than perhaps any other practice, I think God has used this kind of prayer to change who I am. It is a continual reminder that On my own, I could never do what God calls me to do, but I don't have to because God is with me. God's Spirit lives in me, in us. We can also invite one another into prayer in the same natural, spontaneous way. Throughout the New Testament, we're told that the Spirit can comfort us, equip us, empower us, and bring us peace. I was praying with Pastor Joe Marcucci this week, and he quoted Romans 15, 13 where it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Pastor Joe summed it up by saying that hope is a spirit-filled endeavor. We need to remember that because sometimes it seems like it's getting harder and harder to hold on to hope. We can be beacons of hope in a world that is losing hope 
but only by the power of the Spirit. In the very moment that you are tempted to go negative, turn to God and ask for the power to hope. Or when you don't know what to say to someone about Jesus, turn to God in prayer right there and then, silently in your head, and ask for the words. And trust that whatever you're able to say is what God wanted you to say. After all, when Jesus sent out his disciples, he said to not worry even about what to say or how to say it. And if God promises to speak through the disciples under arrest for following Jesus, certainly God can guide you through a conversation with a friend or a neighbor or a coworker. So just ask. In the book of James, it says we do not have because we simply do not ask. So ask Jesus for the courage and the words to bear witness to the only one who can truly heal our broken word, broken world. This is my encouragement to you this week. When something makes you happy, thank God for it immediately. And when you feel down, when you feel less than capable, ask the Spirit for comfort and encouragement. And when someone springs to mind, why not reach out to that person? Maybe that's God's Spirit prompting you to join God in bringing encouragement or joy to someone else. Whatever it is that comes to mind or to heart, engage with God. Pay attention to see if it's just that spicy burrito you had for lunch, or maybe, just maybe, it's the Spirit prompting you to take a step of faith. And that's really the final point I want to bring up about the story of the unnamed servant. On one level, I believe that servant represents the Spirit, but there's more. We start out as Rebecca, the bride. But after that, I believe we're invited to join in the work that the servant is doing. To reach out to others whom God longs to bring into the church. The spiritual family of those who have said yes to the wedding proposal. Ultimately, we need a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit because we are invited to partner with God and join in the work of the Spirit. God is on the move, and if we're not paying attention, we might miss it. There is a lot we can do on our own power, but it will never be enough to accomplish what God is calling us to do. Our High Rock mission is to connect people with God personally and to God's people and God's purposes. That's a wonderful mission, but we can't do it. It's literally beyond our power. We can't make any of those connections happen any more than a farmer can make crops grow. Only God can make it happen. In Arlington, we're waiting right now for the final steps to be able to start using a new building. It's a wonderful space, and I believe that many people will find life in Christ in that very space. But without the Spirit of God, it's just dead brick and mortar. Like it says in the opening of Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Now, some of you here today have been sitting on the sidelines, having been united to Christ long ago, but not really actively following the Spirit to extend Jesus' wedding proposal to the rest of the world that God loves and longs to be reconciled to forever. Perhaps today you could pray. Ask the Holy Spirit what part you could play in that love story. And then listen for however the Spirit prompts you. Reach out to whomever the Spirit brings to mind and serve them in a way that reflects Jesus' love for them. Now, others of you may be here today because you're sort of dating Jesus, you know, checking him out. Jesus has already made up his mind about you, but you're still not sure or have just been reluctant to commit. Perhaps the Spirit is prompting you to finally accept Jesus' proposal today and become part of Jesus' family forever. Either way, consciously create space to listen to the Holy Spirit and receive the Spirit's life-changing, eternity-changing power so that you can show God's love to this world, which so desperately needs it. Friends, during Pastor John's sermon, there were too many moments where I was reminded of ways that I fail to yield to the Holy Spirit, 
where I repeatedly choose my own need for power and control over following the Spirit into something uncomfortable, and yet something that would be good for me and those around me. I imagine that I'm not alone in feeling this way. So I invite you to join me in confession, uh, uh, confessing our sins to God so that we might be freed from their power and available to a new Spirit-filled power in Jesus. To begin our time of confession, let's take a moment, bowing our heads and closing our eyes, to consider what we've received from God's Word and this sermon, and to offer up to God those areas of our lives in which we have strayed from God's purposes. And now, having considered our individual experience, we turn to God together as one people, taking responsibility for the ways our community has not loved God. Let us confess our sins together, saying, Gracious God, we remember that Jesus prayed that his disciples would be unified, but we continue to create division and take sides. We remember the lengths to which Jesus went to cross boundaries and break barriers, but we continue to focus on ourselves and shy away from outsiders. We remember the charge Jesus left his disciples to go into all nations to make disciples, but we so often shrink back from sharing Jesus with others. We confess that we have sinned against you and against one another. We need your grace and mercy, O oh God, and we humbly ask for your forgiveness. By the power of your Spirit, make us into the kind of community that the world needs. Let us participate in this work for the blessing of our neighbors and the glory of his name. Amen. Now hear the good news from God's word. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Friends, know that in Christ you are forgiven and free and be at peace. Amen. Today we were invited into the life-transforming work of yielding to the Holy Spirit so that we might receive the true life and power that Jesus has for us. We might be wondering, where do we even begin? How do we take that first step in this journey? This journey can begin right now, simply by coming to the Lord's table. The communion table is where we acknowledge our great need for God's grace and the redeeming power of the Holy Spirit. This table is where we yield ourselves to God. We have received forgiveness and have been called into a new life that is being empowered by the Holy Spirit. As you prepare to receive communion, Consider the words that God spoke to the Apostle Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and said, Take this and eat. This is my body given up for you. Do this whenever you eat it in my name. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink of it in my name. Because sisters and brothers, whenever we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. Thanks be to God. When I was a new Christian, I heard Paul's instruction to pray continually or pray without ceasing, and I wondered, how's that possible? There's so much else to do in the world, but how are you supposed to do any of that if we're only praying all the time? But Paul wasn't calling us to only pray all the time. He was calling us to also pray all the time. Do your work and Discuss it with God as you do it. Meet with a client and ask to see them like Jesus does. Care for your children and ask God how to guide them in the right way, which is so often confusing. 
Ask the Spirit for patience when you've exhausted your own. Serve people in need while you ask the Spirit for the eyes to see what they need most. This is conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. God is always with us, everywhere. So much of the spiritual life is learning to recognize God's presence with us all the time. It's not that we become stronger the longer we're Christians. It's that we increasingly learn to depend on God's strength more than our own. And that's what gives us true spiritual power that this world desperately needs to see more of. So this week, I encourage you to pray all the time. As you do whatever it is that God called you to do in the world, consciously depend on the Holy Spirit and see what God has the power to do. With that, my friends, I invite you to receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Creator, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.